Okay. Last Friday, we talked about solvation, how things get dissolved within a solution. If something is able to be solvated, we say that it is soluble. If something is unable to be solvated, we say that it is insoluble. Now, if any of you have any aspirations to take AP Bio, you know, I'm the AP Bio teacher and I always have to teach this every year. It's called water potential. And water potential is equal to solute potential plus pressure potential. And I want to focus on this factor. Remember, you don't have to know this for chem, but for AP Bio, this is a must. Solute, poten solute potential's equation is negative I C R T. I stands for ionization constant. C stands for concentration. R stands for the constant, and T stands for temp, which has to be in Kelvin. Now, the two I really want to focus on with you, to, with you all is I and C. Now, let's handle C real quick. It's pretty easy. What's another word for concentration? Molarity. molarity. And what is molarity measured in? What's the unit of measurements? Moles per liter. Moles per liter. That's it. It's pretty simple. Now, I is what I really want to focus on. If something is ionic, it can be solvated. So for instance, if I have sodium chloride, sodium chloride as it stands right now is one unit. But if you place it into water, how many units will, you, will it, here's the word, solvate into? Two. It will solvate into sodium ions and chloride ions. So let's focus on this. Again, this is a review from Friday. Here's a sodium ion. Is it positive or negatively charged? Positive. It's positively charged, of course. Now, if it was positive one or two or three, it doesn't matter. Bottom line, it's positively charged. Which side, which pole of a water molecule would be attracted to the positively charged sodium ion. Arshan? The partially negative oxygen. So this is how all the water molecules will look like when trying to be attracted to sodium. Remember that in water, the big atom is oxygen and two smaller atoms are hydrogen. This is causing the sodium chloride to solvate. Now, on the other hand, here's chloride. Kayla, what is the charge of chloride ion? Um, it's right there. Uh, All you have to worry about is that it is negative. That's it. If it was negative one or two or three or four, it does not matter. You just want to know that it's negative. So Kayla, what, so, what pole of a water molecule would be attracted to the negatively charged chloride ion? The partial positive hydrogens or the partial negative oxygen? That's right, so it's gonna look like this. Now, if chemistry is not your first language and you are totally confused on why I'm drawing those little shapes, let me refresh your memory. Here's a water molecule. Max, what is the large uh, atom, oxygen or hydrogen? That's right. And what are the small ones? Correct. Jade, what is the partial charge of the hydrogen atoms? And the oxygen is negative. If you're wondering why did I put two for oxygen, because you have to have a partial negative and positive side for each um, bond. So positive loves negative. That's called the electrostatic attraction. And so the partial positive hydrogens are going to be attracted to the partial, or excuse me, the negatively charged chloride and the partial negative oxygens are going to be attracted to the um, positive sodium. Okay, so let me do a few more examples for you because, again, you hear this a lot in AP Bio. What if you put 
magnesium chloride into water? How, what would the ionization constant be for that? Anybody but Arshan? Kevin? It would be three. If you're thinking, oh, I thought it'd be two. How many magnesium ions are there? One. Well, how many chloride ions are there? So that's a total of three. It would break up into one magnesium and two chlorides. One more. How about if you put Fe2O3? What is the ionization constant for that? Five. One, two, three, four, five. You'd have iron three, iron three, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. That's it. Now, what if you have something like glucose that is molecular? Can a molecule ionize? No. So before you place it into water, it is one unit. When you after you place it in water, how many units is it? It is still one. C6, H12O6. So a molecule's ionization constant is always one. Yeah. Is it just water that does this or is it any? Pretty much water. Yeah. Okay. So that is something very important I can tell you. It's teaching AP Bio. It comes up. It's even on the AP Bio exam formula sheet. So it's a pretty important concept. So um, if you guys happen to be in my AP class next year, I would hope that you at least remember that. We will just lay down that foundation. Hopefully you can dig up that knowledge later in the next year. All right, let's talk about solubility, new stuff. You ready? Oh, actually, one more old thing. Um, I forgot to mention, there are three ways that you can actually affect solvation, which is dissolving. Agitation, stirring, shaking, mixing, surface area, the smaller particles dissolve better, and then temperature. However, with temperature, there's a little thing, and you guys were walking in here, and as I said this, so you may not recall, do solids tend to dissolve better when the solvent is hot or cold? Hot. Do gases tend to dissolve better into a solvent when the temperature of the solvent is hot or cold? Cold. And here's what I want you to think of. A lot of you have likely drank soda in your life. What temperature does soda tend to get flat faster, warm or cold? Warm. warm. What is dissolved in soda that makes it um, bubbly? CO2. It's carbonation. Well, whenever you warm up the soda, the CO2 comes out of it. In order to get the CO2 to go into it, you have to cool it down. So gases dissolve better when the temp is cold. Solids dissolve better when the temp is warm. All right, here we go. New stuff, solubility. Couple, or three vocab terms here. Unsaturated solution. In an unsaturated solution, The solution contains less solute at a given temp than its saturation point. What this means is that more solute can be added. So uh, I was going to do a visual for you. Let me see if I know I had this stuff. I just need a clear container of some sort. Let's see if I can find something. Okay, now, 
I have to make this. This is from Alpha Seltzer. Small piece. Okay, ready? Now, the definition of an unsaturated solution is every amount of solvent, which is this water, has a limit to how much can be dissolved. How much solvent or sol solute actually? If I just pour, watch this. I'm sure you can go with your gut. It's going to be very simple. If I just put a little like that, do you think this water can dissolve all that? Yeah. How about a little bit more? Can it dissolve all that? Sure. How do I know when it is saturated, where it has reached the maximum amount of solute that the solvent can dissolve? You start to, you, you can stir it, you can shake it, but no matter what, you're still going to find salt or sugar or alpha cells there from the bottom. Let me put this all in here. Stir it up. I don't see any alpha cells there on the bottom. So when I say this solution is currently saturated or is it unsaturated? It's still unsaturated. But when I start adding it, and no matter how hard I agitate it, stir it, shake it, all that stuff, and it's still collecting on the bottom, it's saturated. That means that you have reached the maximum amount of solutes that a solvent can hold at a given temperature. So unsaturated means you have not reached that maximum yet. You can still add solute to the solvent and the solute will dissolve. But a saturated solution <clears throat> is when the max amount of solute is dissolved. You know this because solute particles dissolve and crystallize in solutions. This is known as equilibrium. So imagine right now, hypothetically, my little blue cup up there is maxed out with alpha cells. If I put some more alpha cells in there, and that alpha cells I just introduced dissolves, that means that some alpha cells that is dissolved will crystallize. It's going to basically come out of the solution and form uh, crystals on the bottom. So let me see if I can try to draw this for you guys so it can perhaps make a little bit better sense. Okay, so I have a beaker here, and there's salt water here. So obviously it's a combination of salt and water, and it is saturated. I can't add any more salt and expect it all to dissolve. But what if I did? So here's my salt shaker goes into the container now let's say that this stuff dissolves what will happen to the some of the some of the salt that is already dissolved in the water max paying attention focus what will already happen to some what will happen to some of the salt that is already dissolved in the water if I add more salt to the saturated solution and that salt that I am adding dissolves. Arshan? It's gonna come back out. So down here, I'm gonna start to see some salt. What happened here is, oops, solute that was, keyword, was dissolved crystallized no that's right solute that was dissolved crystallized back to a solid 
due to the solvation of more solutes. So think of it like this. Imagine this. I, I just have an element. My classroom here can hold 30 students. Max, that's my saturation point. What if the author sends me a 31st student and that 31st student has to stay here? What would happen to one of you? You get kicked out. That's what happens in the saturated solution. You can add more solutes to the students, but that means that some of the students that were already here are going to have to leave. This room is the solution. And so the solute is going to recrystallize. And as Arshan said, the solute that you're adding, it will be different than the solute that is crystallizing back to the solid. Yeah, cool. If I'm calculating the what of a solution, you would not, you would uh, not consider the solute because technically that solute is out of the solution, not a part of the solution. It's just sitting there. It's on the sidelines. It has to be dissolved. Yes. Like yeah. It won't. It'll, it won't change the molarity, but it will change just the speed, the rate. Yes. That's what I'm getting to. Yep. All right. So he brings up the temperature. Let's bring that up. That is the point. That gets me to the third one, guys. Here's what we have to keep in mind. Every solution has varying saturation points at uh, different temps and pressures, okay? And that gets me to a third aspect, and that is called super saturated solution. Now, if you don't listen to what I'm telling you here, you're gonna come up, your weird brains will come up with its own idea of what super saturated means, and I'm nine times out of 10 gonna be right in saying it's gonna be the wrong definition. Here's where the brains of students tend to go when they don't hear me. If I said, what is a super saturated solution? You say, it's when you add more solute than what the solution can handle. No, it's not. So listen up, no fading out. Let's talk about super saturated solutions. The definition of a super saturated solution is not a solution can hold more solute than it should. Or let me rephrase that. Here's the definition students come up with. A, a solution has more solute than the saturation point. That's kind of halfway around. Here's how it is. A solution can hold more solute than it normally would at a given temp and pressure. So I'm going to give you guys a scenario and because my tablet here is being really funky with YouTube, I'm gonna to switch to my other laptop and show you videos of super saturated solutions. And that will be the end of today's class, I think. We'll be, now we'll do gases and then we'll be done. All right, so here's my uh, scenario. We have 64 grams of calcium chloride at 10 degrees Celsius. Remember, temperature matters here. So 64 grams of calcium chloride 
can dissolve in 100 grams of H2O at 10 degrees Celsius. 64 grams of calcium chloride can dissolve in 100 grams of water at 10 degrees. You can dissolve all of it at that temperature. Here's what we're going to do. At 27 degrees Celsius, you could, you could theoretically dissolve 96 grams of calcium chloride in 100 grams of H2O. Look at that. So the warmer it gets, the more you can dissolve. That's the moral of the story here. Remember, solvated is just the fancy chem word for dissolved. All right. And so here's what we do in order to make a solution super saturated. Step one, heat up the solution, or excuse me, heat up the water. Not the, it's not a solution yet, it's just water. Heat up the water to 27 degrees Celsius. Step two, add and solvate um, 96 grams of calcium chloride. And step three, cool the solution down to 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's it. So, uh, Derek, at 10 degrees Celsius, how, what was the, look at all the information I have on the screen. At 10 degrees Celsius, what is the maximum amount of calcium chloride that water should be able to hold? 64 grams, but, I heated the water up to 27 degrees Celsius. I dissolved 96 grams of calcium chloride. So now at 10 degrees Celsius, after I finish step three, how much, how much calcium chloride do I have dissolved? Read steps one, two, and three. 32? No, I have all 96. It does, that's right. So you cool it down and you, you have not, here's what we have. At 10 degrees Celsius, we should only be able to do 64. But because we cheated, we heated it up, we dissolved it at that hot temp and then we cooled it down. You're gonna have 96 grams of calcium chloride at 10 degrees Celsius when you should only be able to have a maximum of 64 grams. This is known as a super saturated solution. It has more solute than it should hold at a given temperature and pressure. The only way that you can actually make it super saturated is you have to heat up the solution, dissolve a lot more solutes at that hotter uh, temperature, and then let it cool down. So this is known as a super saturated solution. And it's just those three steps. You heat it up, you dissolve more, and then you let it cool down to a cooler temp. So, a few facts about uh, super saturated solutions. Super saturated solutions are unstable. If a tiny amount of the same, that's important, it has to be the same solute is added, and this is called a seed crystal. The excess 
solute will crystallize. So I think that's where you were getting your number, Derek. If what is, it has 96, it should only have 64. So how much extra solute is in that? What is 96 minus 64? 32, right? 32. So if I have a solution that is super saturated and I add a seed crystal to it, um, if the numbers work out, 32 grams of that solute is going to turn back into a solid and that's what we call crystallize. So um, crystallization can also occur if there's a scratch in the glass of the container. So I'm going to pause the video here. I'm going to switch over to my other laptop. If you want to look it up, type in uh, super saturated solution. It should be the first video that comes up on YouTube. So I'm going to pause the lesson here. All right. And the last thing I have for you all today is the solubility of gases. Solubility of gases is less at high temps that means that gases is all better at warm temps or excuse me my bad cold temps now in my AP class, I tell my students all the time, you can't just know two plus two is four. You have to be able to explain why two plus two is four. So you can't just say solubility of gases is less at high temps. You guys have to know why. Why is this happening? The reason why is because the kinetic energy that is associated with warm temps. Remember, when you rub your hands together and your hands get really warm, that's gonna be a high kinetic energy. Ayla Howard, grab this on your way up. Kinetic energy, which is associated with hot temps, allows gas particles to escape from solutions. So when you have a temperature of a solution that's really hot or warm, the gases are more likely to get out. This is why if you leave your soda on the counter, it's going to go flat faster than in the fridge because the counter is, cool, is warmer than the fridge and the gases are going to be at a greater kinetic energy, which means they're going to be able to escape. But if you keep them in the fridge, they have, they're trapped in the liquid for longer because the kinetic energy is weaker when temperatures are colder. So as a solution's temp increases, the solubility of a gaseous solute decreases. All right. And the grand finale for today is going to be Henry's Law. And you guys are going to have a homework assignment that I'm going to post onto Canvas. I'll text you when I have it ready, probably during fifth lunch. It'll be due uh, by 11.59 tonight. Henry's Law is S1 divided by P1 equals S2 over P2. S1 is solubility and P1 is pressure 
And these are going to be your initial values. S2 and P2 are also solubility and pressure. And these are your new values. Now solubility is going to be measured in grams per liter. Pressure can be measured in atmospheres or KPA or millimeters of mercury. Typically one of those three. How many variables are there in these problems? Four. How many will you be given? Three. three. You'll be given three out of four variables. You just have to figure out which ones and then plug them in. Be sure that you isolate them. I'm going to uh, post the worksheet on the canvas later today. I'm going to uh, whip it up during lunch and I will text you when it is available. And again, all you have to do is just find the fourth variable. Yeah. Uh, hypothetically, sure. I don't know if gases are going to be the exact same way because there's no association to the particles. Yeah, that's that's why even when you have it in the fridge, so it still goes flat. It just takes longer. All right, guys, be on the lookout for that.